in the last lecture we discussed surface states band bending how the bands corresponding to the electronic states deviate as we move from the bulk to the surface metal semiconductor interfaces and schottky and ohmic contacts in this lecture we will spend most of our time discussing semiconductor heterostructure, formation of the semiconductor heterostructure and the basic rules, how we align the bands corresponding to different semiconductors to form the heterostructure and also the fabrication methods for lattice matched interfaces between two semiconductors. So the previous lecture we discussed the interface between metal and uh, semiconductor. In this lecture, we will discuss the interface between two semiconductors. So the relevant parameters for understanding how we can match two semiconductor surfaces and form a proper interface are the work function of the material. Work function is the energy required to remove an electron from the material into the vacuum. And um, electron affinity, that is the energy difference between the conduction band edge and the vacuum level whereas work function is the energy difference between the vacuum level and the Fermi level. Band gap of these two material, the conduction band edge, valency band edge, Fermi level, that again depends upon doping and the built-in voltage. Okay. Now, in this picture, what we are seeing is two semiconductor both are n type both of the semiconductors are actually n type semiconductor um, we can see that because the fermi level is close to the conduction band in both cases okay and the vacuum level is somewhere here and the band gap for this semiconductor on the left side this is the band gap eg1 and the right side you have the band gap eg2 and here we have a situation where eg1 is less than eg2 that is what we have and the guiding rule that tells how we are going to align to semiconducting material in the energy, energy space to form a, an interface between two to form a junction that is called Anderson rule. So it's a very simple picture, but the realistic materials can be very complicated and the rules also can be complicated and it is involved. But this is how to the first degree that we understand how these two materials are joined. Okay. So the Anderson rule says that the first what you do is you align the vacuum levels to get the relative position of the band edges. So that is the first thing. So you have a vacuum level and you align the rest of the band edges, conduction band, valency band, and the Fermi level, everything with respect to that. So vacuum level is your reference. Vacuum level is somewhere here. So as you can see here, you have taken the vacuum level reference and rest of them you can think think as if you have 
actually hang from that point okay it is hanging from that point vacuum level then the band offsets at the interface that you can calculate using the electron affinities and the band gap for example the conduction band discontinuity at the interface delta ec that is basically the difference between two electron affinities and the valency band discontinuity in this case you also need to consider the band gap differences too okay so if you look at this this is nothing but chi 1 minus chi 2 then you have eg1 minus eg2 that's what this is so chi 1 minus chi 2 then eg1 minus eg2 you have to consider the difference of the uh, to electron affinity and also the band gaps then only you can consider the discontinuity in the valency band that is how you calculate that much discontinuity you have to keep at the interface then you align the rest of the material such that the Fermi level at the interface is actually continuous Fermi level throughout is continuous because once you join these two material the Fermi level that is a level that is that tells the level up to which the electron is filled until you join the material the Fermi level can be different because the electron levels are different now the moment you join these two material the electron level should be same throughout because it become now one sim one solid okay it's one conducting solid it's like you are taking two uh, containers of water and you're connecting it with some kind of a tube so that the moment you connect it you're going to make the vacuum the water level same in both containers that is what you're doing here okay so once you do all these things you will get structure something similar to this here so the band edges here this is delta ac that is given by the two electron affinity the delta ev that is that is given by this thing here then you also made sure that the, the fermi level is continuous here okay for example you can see that fermi level is discontinuous in these two cases now you lowered it but you have to keep that discontinuity at the bandage both the conduction balance band that that need be preserved there then you tilt you shift the rest of the band bands so that the fermi level is continuous that is how you get this structure here all right that is the process of aligning the bands to join two different semiconductors or, or the same semiconductor but different doping levels all right now let us um, look into what are the different cases of aligning these bands so now what we have is we have a material which is a combination of two different materials so we call it actually hetero structure okay so this is the case of an nn hetero structure i am calling this nn because both sides are actually n doped all right now depending upon how the band edges are going to align there are basically three broad categories of heterostructures all right so one the first one is type one we also call it straddling so in this case what you have is the conduction band and valency band of one side this is the interface okay this band gap in one material is larger than the other other side but they also align in such a way that the conduction band and valency band of the other material falls in the middle of this okay so this is a straddling heterostructure you have conduction band valency band one side here other side here it's like this the second type is 
called type 2 or staggered ethereal structure okay staggered means again you have two different band gaps then but when you do the alignment as prescribed by the anderson's rule you will do in such a way that this is going to be this way if type 1 was like this this will be like this okay now this is called staggered heterostructure okay and there is also a third kind is called mismatched or broken gap so in this case this in the type 2 case you still have a region where the band gaps are actually overlapping okay here the band gap of the left side right uh, right side is completely overlapping with that of the left side in this case in this case there is a partial overlap but in this case there is no overlap the band gap in energy space is here and the band gap of the second one is here absolutely there is no overlap that is type 3 or this is called mismatch so in that case what you have is you have structure one of this material which forms the structure here another one is somewhere here earlier what we had is type 1 type 2 and this is type 3 this is called mismatch or stagger okay and these are the three typical examples for each of these types okay and uh, the different quantities parameters that you that you use to align these are given here and this is your vacuum level and this is also another way to illustrate these three alignments here okay and the the feature that we need to remember here is for type 1 the quantum well for the carriers in both bands yeah? quantum well for the carriers is there in both bands okay that we will discuss in detail but what I am trying to say here is in the type 1 case you can have a quantum well for both the holes and also for the electrons okay and type 2 what you have is you have a quantum well in one and a barrel in other so just to understand these statements all you need to look at is these edges here in this case the well is going to form here because this is the lower energy for the electrons in this conduction band and here you have holes in the valency band a well is going to form here that's in both cases for an for a hole this is the lower energy region and for an electron this is a lower energy region okay so you have well for or lower energy region for both holes and electrons but in this type 2 what we are saying here is there is a well for one type of carrier but there is a barrier for the other type of carrier and it's easy to see from here this is a well for this kind of carrier but this is actually a wherever it forms the well here it will be a barrier for this carrier cohorts but that is true for the, the converse also true because now there is a well here and a barrier here for the electrons if you for for going the, for, by this way again whether you will get a well or you will get a barrier or where the carriers end up and all these detail all these depends on details of the doping and the other fine parameters of the interface which is not a topic of discussion for this uh, slide but what i'm trying to say is there are three broadly there are three kinds of um, heterostructure there's a type 1 there's a type 2 and type 3 and they are classified according to how the conduction valency bands actually shifted in the energy direction in the energy axis with respect to the vacuum level all right so now let's take some um, examples okay the most common example for a quantum well or whenever we say quantum well what comes to our mind is gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide material such a fantastic material just given a lot of interesting and important results which are both 
you know thrilling for fundamental physicists and also for technologists okay so the gallium arsenide system or gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide system belongs to type 1 okay so this actually i would say this is type 1 so you can see that the aluminum gallium arsenide side has a larger band gap the gallium arsenide has a small slower band gap and they are aligned this way so this is a type 1 okay and here what we are seeing is an intrinsic gallium arsenide or undoped gallium arsenide where the fermi level is lying in the middle and the n type or n doped aluminum gallium arsenide so the fermi level is close to the conduction band and of course when you do the process you had this structure initially now you have to when you when you when you align the vacuum level you got something like this that is when that's how you define the type 1 type 2 and type 3 how they are displaced when it is actually aligned from the vacuum level okay this is type 1 and that is what we have for gallium arsenide now you have these two fermi levels so how these fermi levels are aligned so you have this fermi level and you going going to shift it both side so that Fermi levels are aligned, but that you have to do keeping the band discontinuity unaltered. So whatever the delta EC, these two regions you have to keep unaltered. Delta EC and delta EB that you cannot change, but rest of things you have to align. Okay. When you do that, you are going to get a small triangle shaped bell at the interface. Okay. This is the quantum bell why it is a quantum bell we will come to that in a minute okay this another example is indium arsenide gallium and demonite both are p-type and that's what we have here here also this is again now this is actually um, I would say this is like the, 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 the type 3 because there is no much overlap between these two bands okay so now you have to align in interface you have to keep this way but at the same time you have to align the rust so you will get this quantum bell in this case and you can also get another quantum bell but that is in the other material that's one quantum bell is in this material the other quantum bell is in this material but now since it is a p type material so you have to consider that the coals are the majority charge carriers there so so you have you will have a quantum bell in the valency band in this case you have a quantum bell in the conduction band okay so that is a difference so here you have a hall gas in this case you have a electron gas okay so you have a hall hall conducting Charge, carrier. charge carriers are actually holes here charge carriers are electrons and we call them electron gas and hole gas but that detail also you will see in, a, in, a, in either in this class or next class but we call one as a hole gas because the the point here is the electrons and holes in this material move like free electron gas free electron uh, free electrons or free holes as the molecules of ideal gas that's what we call whole gas or electron gas but those details we will deal in a minute okay in either in this class or next class we will do it all right so these are two different examples one is a type 1 and this is actually a type 3 okay we have two kinds of systems here all right so now let us look at the common system material systems which generates all these different uh, uh, heterostructure so this diagram here relates the lattice constant of various material and the band gap so you will see very soon that the interface 
where these two materials are actually meeting is where all the action is going to take place. As you have seen in the previous slide, your charge carriers are end up in this well, either here or here or here, which is right at the interface. So the quality of this interface is probably the most important thing when we consider these material systems. Because that is where all the action, all the movement of charge carriers are going to take place. That is where these charge carriers are going to end up. Okay. So how good, how crystalline, how perfect this interface is of paramount importance. For that, what we need from the solid state physics point of view is a perfect lattice matching. When I say perfect lattice matching is there are no defects or dislocations at the interface. We will address how these structures are grown, how these structures are made in the next slide. But this is going to summarize the importance and the quality of this heterostructure. So this axis is the lattice constant and silicon is here, germanium is here and the lattice constant of other semiconductors, 3 fives, gallium arsenide is somewhere here, gallium phosphate is here, aluminum indium phosphate is here, indium phosphate is here, okay. And um, cadmium telluride is somewhere here, mercury telluride is here, indium antimonide is here, okay. Now, this two pictures here, these are TEM, transmission electron microscopy images of this interface. So you can see that this, there's a small color change here and there is also a small color change here too which is hard to notice but here it is in this specific it is apparent. So you have gallium arsenide phosphate and indium gallium arsenide here. So when you move from this region to this region the interface is so perfect there is you don't feel that there is any change. If you ignore that those are two different made of two different sets of material elements we just assume that those are all just points that is points they are just continuous there is no huge there is not much mismatch between this system and the system that means the lattice of these two materials are so identical that there is a perfect lattice match interface okay similarly here also this is gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide interface in this case also you don't feel as you draw a line from here to here it's perfectly periodic and there are no defects there are no dislocation these are real images of these materials between these two systems okay the perfect lattice match that means the electron which moves through this interface is not going to feel any difference between that side and this side. Of course, it's going to see a difference in the energy of the two sides, the band gap in two sides, but there are no defects. It's perfectly periodic. Okay. And um, this graph here is showing you how the lattice constant is going to vary as you change the composition because one side is you have gallium arsenide. This is gallium arsenide, other side is aluminum arsenide. So you go from gallium and replace arsenide and you go to aluminum gallium arsenide by replacing the gallium by aluminum progressively. So that is actually gallium 1 minus 6 aluminum X. So you replace the gallium with aluminum slowly, slowly in this fraction. Now we can see how much the lattice constant is changing. So that is how these two materials are made. One is gallium arsenide, one is aluminum gallium arsenide. So what do you see? If you look at the lattice constant here, this is gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, they are pretty much on, on, almost on a straight line. You can see that. There's no huge difference between those two sides. Right? So, here also you can see that as you go from here to here, the lattice constant is changing by like a very, very small fraction 5.653 Armstrong to 5.66. That is 0 0.01 ish approximately that is the change that is one person change 
in lattice counts. I mean, less than one percent change, right? So this is telling you how the various band edges are, or where the various band edges are, depending on depending on the direction. For example, the band gap here is the gamma where it's a direct band gap okay when it's a direct band gap means the position where the minimum of the conduction band maximum of the valency band they are actually at the same k point at same wave vector okay and this is gamma valley okay these details are not really relevant but i'm what i'm trying to say is this is telling you what is the typical band gap for this kinematic now as a function of the composition this is how the band gap is going to change i mean band gap at various points are going to change when you take this is gallium arsenide this is aluminum gallium aluminum arsenide so this is your compound work gallium aluminum arsenide and the x varies from 0 to 1 okay when you do that, you start from gallium arsenide and you become aluminum arsenide and in between this is gallium aluminum arsenide. Now, you can see that until um, a fraction of 0.4, close to 0.4, you can see that this gamma or the direct band gap, this is a direct band gap, these are indirect band gaps. Okay. So this is the maximum of the conduction band. The maximum of the conduction band is not changing, but the sorry, maximum of the valency band is not changing, but the minimum of the conduction band is actually changing, right? So the band gap is actually from maximum of the valency band to the minimum of the conduction band. So this configuration for x is equal to zero, you have that at the gamma point. It's a direct band gap. But now, as you vary the x composition you can see that the band gap is also increasing because you have to go from here to here right this is the band gap gallium arsenide is here aluminum gallium arsenide here you need to go from here to here when you vary x0 to 1 what that means is your band gap is actually increasing at, at some point of time around 0.4 the now the band gap is actually above the x point but x is actually an indirect band gap okay that's x valley here that's the indirect band gap so what that means is the material is actually changing from direct band gap to indirect band gap okay so for a lot of applications we need direct band gap especially when there is a where there are, there are photons are involved or optical transitions are involved you actually need a material with a direct band gap so almost all these uh, devices are made with the composition x which is less than less than 0 0.4 that's where most of these devices are actually made okay that is kind of the overview of this um, gallium arsenide or 35 uh, heterostructure and uh, how perfect you can see how perfect those interfaces are and you will see very soon that because of such a perfect lattice mesh interface the electron also possesses really superior mobility and other transport characteristics now we can look into how these um, material systems are actually made what process these material systems are actually made okay there are two main processes where this really high quality high purity materials are grown they are stacked the overall process is called epitaxy where you are actually growing layer by layer atom by atom of one material on, on top of the another material and you can stack various materials in various sequences too of course there are a lot of details and uh, this is a very tedious and very involved process which requires very expensive and highly sophisticated machineries and various characteristics tools and everything and the first process is called molecular beam 
epitaxy, MBE. Here, it is very similar to a physical, it's a physical vapor deposition system where you have various pockets which are generally called effusion cells. You can think these are like some kind of container where the material that you want to deposit or you want to grow is there inside that material. It's kept in that, that container and you are going to heat it and you will pass the vapors of this to the certain, to certain substrate where you are going to grow this structure. And you have a lot of controls here how much atoms, how many atoms are emitted, how many uh, by controlling various uh, parameters such as temperature, the pressure and everything. Okay. And this whole thing happens at really, really ultra high vacuum, something like close to 10 to the minus 11, okay, tall. Okay. Now there are various characteristic tools such as read or X, uh, you know, uh, XRD, OGS spectroscopy, all kinds of uh, thing which is going to verify that you are going the right, you are growing the right material and the right sequence and everything. It's all these characters that happens in C2. Okay. And a lot of other bells and whistles to this. Anyway, but this is just an overview. And uh, this whole thing is called MBE or molecular beam epitaxy. And this is a picture which we have seen in the pre previous uh, view graph where you have interface of gallium marcinate and aluminum gallium marcinate which are grown in sequence and like a grating okay and as you can see as you go from one end to the other end you don't see any change in the periodicity of the overall lattice though so they are so close this they are the, the lattice constant of these two material aluminum gallium marcinate and gallium marcinate are so close that doesn't change very much okay this is one technique and the other technique is something called emulsivity that is called metal organic chemical vapor deposition okay here um, this is a cvd process chemical vapor deposition process but this is also involved but it's a reactive uh, uh, process where you have the organic compound volatile organic compounds of the species that you want to deposit in this case the illustration here is you are depositing an indium phosphate. So what you have is indium and phosphorus layers. But there are two kinds of reactive gases here. One is trimethyl indium and you have phosphine PH3. So these two you will pass into some kind of chamber. Of course, a lot of um, calculations and a lot of simulations are done to design this chamber and what direction, how much you, how you pass it, pumping speed, all kinds of things are actually involved. Then you have a lot of, you have a substrate holder where it is hot, everything is kept hot and the gases will hit the substrate where you are keeping all these wafers, which you can see the circle, circular you know, thing which is on that you know hot surface then when it when it'll hit it will undergo some chemical reaction is going to get adsorbed this different the species and there are some pumping mechanism which will pump out the other volatile part in this case the ch4 with the say byproduct that will leave the chamber and you will end up with getting only the required on the on elements that is in this case indium and phosphorus so of course this is also a very popular process especially for industrial scale growth because mbe what we discussed in the previous slide is a very slow process and it is uh, it takes a lot of time and uh, there are uniformity issues because all kinds of things are there but for a commercial scale fabrication of heterostructure for example for applications in light emitting diodes or all kinds of other optoelectronics application where uh, for example your, your screen computer screen all kinds of things those are all made by cvd okay or mocvd process because you can grow large area thing large area heterostructure with a relatively very good uniformity 
and the one important thing that i would like to notice or i would like to bring to you, bring it to your notice here is the mbe is actually a high vacuum high vacuum process okay i would say ultra high vacuum ultra high vacuum process but this is actually a low vacuum process because it's a cvd process you have gases flowing into the chamber low vacuum it's a low vacuum process okay and um, there are these organic compounds corresponding to whatever elements that you want to deposit there are always some kind of organic compounds available for example silicon is grown by using something called a tramethyl silane it's a liquid okay and you will heat it and you'll get the vapor and gallium is grown by trimethyl gallium germanium is grown by tetra ethyl germane so you will find i mean this is just a few examples you will find the corresponding metal organic compounds are all the commonly used material to grow this and this is a very very popular technology okay so this is how this these are the two techniques how the epitaxy growth of the citrus structures are actually grown so in the next class what we will do is we look into the details of these interfaces that has been created by combining two semiconductors all right